This is why we say do your own research. It's not just a thing to plug at the beginning of this to cover ourselves. It is really how you should do this. You should come up with your own theories and execute on them within your means and then learn from it. What's up, Candy Fam? My name is Nate, that's David, and this is the Talking Candy Weekly Update. Each week, we take a look at everything going on in the world of candy and give you an idea of what we think is most important to be paying attention to. David and I both have collections of our own, but none of this is financial advice. Please do your own research. We are just here to have a good time. If you enjoy these videos, if you get value out of them, your like and subscribe go a long way in helping us reach a wider audience. David, how you doing? Doing good, Nate. Doing good. Uh, it's been an interesting 24 hours, but uh, we've got more than usual to talk about this week. Can't wait to get into it. Yep. Today was pack drop lineup number two from the leadoff series, 2022 leadoff series. So plenty to talk about there. That will be the meat and potatoes of the show, obviously. So we will get into the new pack drop structure and the, the lineup number two drop. But in addition, we will be talking about some of the new quality of life upgrades on the Candy website. Got some upgrades to filters and some other things there. Uh, we will be ripping some packs at the end of the show, and uh, as as we've been doing, and you know, getting into a little this, little that, and just getting our takes on on what we've seen today and and over the last week. So, let's start by jumping into some Twitter updates. As always, if you're not following at Talking Candy NFT, this is where the quickest updates go out. Anything new that's happening. Uh, so this week we had the the Braves one of one World Series ring auction on Bitski, and that ended last Thursday night, I believe. Was it Thursday night? Friday night? It was the end of last week, uh, and we saw this go for 7,500. Didn't have as much activity. Uh, as the the Jackie Robinson one of one, not that we were expecting it to. Obviously, you've mm -hmm. got a, a smaller fan base. You're hitting about one thirtieth of the fan base in terms of who would realistically be interested in this. But still, a really cool sale. Still very uh, high end, expensive NFT. Came with some really cool real life perks, including throwing out the first pitch, calling out play ball, going to a, a game in, in really nice seats. So love seeing the the IRL stuff attached to these one of ones. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, my favorite thing was the uh, being on the field for batting practice. Yeah, uh, was was the perk that sounded most exciting to me. Uh, and so definitely the whole thing being down the field for batting practice and then having that lead into being part of uh, calling out play ball and all that. It's uh, it's really cool stuff. Stuff that your average baseball fan does not get an opportunity to to uh, to have as part of their their game day experience. So. Pretty cool. Congrats to to whoever grabbed that. We also had a, another huge sale this week. Uh, we had the Aaron Judge 2021 one of one go for 21,000. This is the sixth largest sale to date overall. It was listed and then immediately sold. So it kind of seems like there was some some communication on the sidelines, which not not surprising and obviously no issue with that. These are these are big deals. So probably somebody that reached an agreement put it up there and uh, and it was quickly purchased. So cool to continue seeing big sales of that nature. We also have had some one of ones pulled. We had the, the Buxton and the Chris Sale from lineup number one get pulled. Uh, this was on the 29th, so four mm, days ago. Last Friday. Last Friday, mm -hmm. yep. And uh, so yeah, at this point we have seven of the lineup one, one of ones have been pulled. And like I said, Buxton and Sale were both last week. Lindor was shortly before that. And then today we had the the lineup two drop. So we've got the some early Otani sales here. We've, this is a couple hours old at this point. I should have checked it real quick before we started. So, but this was within the first two hours of the, the packs going live. So. In those first two hours, we had a couple epics go for right around a thousand, and a handful of rares go for between three hundred and five fifty. Always volatile price points uh, right after the initial drop. Super low supply because not many packs have been ripped, 
and figuring out what that what that demand is and, and what those price points are. So that's why you see a lot of prices all over the place uh, all over the place there. And another one of one was pulled. Uh, this was the the first of the lineup too, and it was a big one. One of the top four guys in this lineup. We had the the Scherzer get pulled, and that was pretty wild to see right in the right in this first day, right in the first few hours. So an unlikely pull there. Congrats to whoever grabbed that. Uh, but yeah, so that's that kind of summarizes the the main updates there. But uh, let's jump into a couple. There's there's some really nice quality of life stuff going on right now, and it's mm -hmm. it's obviously needed. But uh, there we're getting it on both fronts. We're getting it on the third party sites. So we're also getting it on candy. We'll go into candy second. Let's start on the third party sites. So Serial Chaser has been it's been my primary research tool since day one. Um, absolutely love this. Love the the way that this works. But it was a challenge and not super useful over the last couple of weeks since these new cards came out, especially for guys like Trout who have multiple cards now. And you mm -hmm. were seeing the the charts get populated with both sales and it was muddling everything. But Willagroon has gone in and updated this. So when you type in a player that has multiple cards, you'll get the, the, two, the two icons and then you can click into the specific one that you're actually interested in looking at and then get the, the updated sales from there. So huge upgrade here to be able to have this pull accurately. Uh, huge, huge for you and I, especially you, mm -hmm. pulling, uh, <laughs> pulling some of the data. As many, I'm sure, have assumed, uh, we've got a lot of, a lot of my visuals being fueled by a lot of David's data. We, we tag team this stuff, so I'm sure that you are thrilled to have this back in the, in the arsenal. Um, it was a, it was a rough couple of weeks having to make do. Uh, particularly, I believe there were seven players from lineup number one that. We're also on the all-star set. And so for those seven players, um, it was a lot more manual and just not being able to lean on that excellent serial chaser research. Uh, but now that he's updated that, at least those uh, those lineup number one players are good to go. He still needs to add the 2022 copies for lineup number two, uh, but they just came out today. So I'm sure it won't be long before he gets those added. And at the very least, players that existed in 21 that now also have a 22 copy, their 21 chart is still safe. So it's not crossing the wires like it did with lineup number one. Like if you pull up Scherzer, it's not gonna pull up his 22 sales, it'll just pull up his 21. Let's, so that, let me check that real quick, cause I'm not sure. I oh, know you're, you're right. I thought I saw one where that wasn't true, but it looks like it's working for Bogarts. I could have sworn I pulled one up earlier that it had done the, the overlap, but Looks like what you're saying is is correct, at least in this instance. But yes, good point to make that there is some updating that's needed with everything that that just dropped. Uh, but there's only 90 new cards compared to 180 on the old one, mm -hmm. and I'm guessing that any any process like this gets faster as you do it more. So hopefully we'll see those uh, in due time. So definitely go back to to leveraging that. I certainly will be. And then we also got a really nice upgrade on Serial 1. And it's going to be this checklist tab up here. So as it has been, if you if you go into your collection on the Candy website and you grab your, uh, your collector link, I'll just go in and show it real quick. Go to my collection, and it's right here. Share collection, copy. And then in Serial 1, you just paste it right up at the top. And now you're going to get these this nice list as opposed to the collection tab is still here and we'll show you your thumbnails those will get lit up my top one's gonna have nothing in it because uh wait oh this is still just lineup one okay so you can mm -hmm. see everything populates lights up uh that you own and you've got your total count up at the top here but then when you go into the checklist it's in the list form instead which depending on what you're doing this can be really helpful, especially if you want to figure out what you have for duplicates. So again, my 22 uh, lineup two is pretty bare because I haven't done much yet today. I haven't opened anything, but you can see here with my, my lineup one, you've got the distribution uh, and also just added all of these links over here. So if you want a Anthony Rendon Epic, you can click the little Epic icon and it'll bring you right into the candy website filter to 
Rendon Epix. So really, really nice feature there. Excited to have both of these tools back in the arsenal and appreciate all the work that Clay and Willa Garoon do uh, with, with these tools for us. So thank you. Um, did you were you going to say something there? Oh, I was just going to reaffirm that particularly the Serial 1 checklist is, is so clean. And, and Clay did a fantastic job with that. And we couldn't be more appreciative for the, the time that those two put in to, to give us these tools. Absolutely. Uh, while we wait for the primary site to, to get the polish that, that we know it needs. Yes, it definitely does. We definitely need this stuff to be in-house for... for new users to come in and, and be able to understand what's going on. But in the meantime, those of us who have been here for a few months and have found the tools at our disposal, it's uh, it's been hugely, hugely appreciated. So let's, uh, let's see. Oh, the, the candy updates, the candy user experience updates. So the, the big one, first and foremost, is the, the lag time on sales, the pending balance, has been reduced from seven days to five days. So that's a really nice upgrade. Hopefully that continues to move in that direction, get down to 24, 48 hours, I think is what we're all hoping for. Uh, but to get it from seven down to five, to move in the right direction, any positive improvement is, is welcome. So happy to have that. And then the, oh, the filters. So we've got some upgrades on the filters here. So Let's say if we just go into active listings and we go over to filters, we can now filter by team as well as by rarity. We already have the rarity, but if we filter by Red Sox and then we only want to see the rare Red Sox because those blue Red Sox cards just look so good. And now all you're going to get are all of the active listings for rare Red Sox players. So it's a nice, nice upgrade. We also have the go back in here um, actually not when you go into active but if you just type in a player you've got the active listings coming up as the initial population as opposed to it had been showing all at first which could be a little confusing if something recent had occurred that, that would throw you off now it just goes into the active listings and same deal here with the prices and the additions so adding those team filters getting it to go to active listings first and decreasing the the pending balance from seven to five days. I think that's it. Am I forgetting anything? Th that is it for now. And, and it is a step in the right direction. Um, there are some more things coming. This isn't everything that they announced, um, but the time frame they gave us was late May. So we still have a few weeks left for them to hit that time frame. But it is encouraging that rather than waiting for everything to be ready at once, as they've gotten things ready, they've been rolling those out over this period of time to just tide us over until they have the full set of upgrades. Of, of course, most importantly, we need to see that ability to sil filter between the different sets, you know, between the 21 All-Stars and the 22 leadoff set. Um, but other than that, you know, they're, they're making progress. Yeah. Undoubtedly, that 21-22 filter is the one that we desperately need, uh, especially now that we've got an additional lineup. We have, uh, you know, close to 300 cards now that we've got a lot of overlap and need to be able to differentiate between the two. We also need these filters in my collection in order to, to better navigate that. So like you said, these things are coming. They marked end of May as the deadline, but they seem to be trickling them out as they're completed, which is, I would prefer that. Give, it, give us what you got when you have it. And mm -hmm. hopefully we continue to see more of those upgrades uh, in the coming weeks. So let's... Uh, I think that's I think that's all the that's all the housekeeping. Should we get into the to the main event here? Uh yeah. Let, let's talk about the new cards. Let's talk about the other sales, the other changes. So um, let's let's start just real quick with with the update on how this how these pack drops are working. We had another significant update this week and that was the announcement that instead of having two drops per lineup with hundred the same 180 players in those two drops, we are now not going to see any two drops be the same players. So we've split those 180 into separate lineups of 90 each. And even though this visual 
still only has four lineups on it, we actually are going to have seven now. So the initial lineup number one, obviously, is, is those 180 players that were released. But now we're going to have 30,000 packs come out for each lineup with a unique 90 players. And then the following week or the following lineup, that will have a new 90 players. So once that pack drop is done and those 90 players have been distributed, we'll move on to unique players the following week. So it's only one drop per lineup now as opposed to two. The mint counts stay the same. They still come with the same caveat that although they are theoretically two and a half to 5,000 per player, it's really half of that right now with some variance for the random, uh, the random element of, of how things get pulled. But so we, we do still have 50% of the packs vaulted, but this is, this is what we're looking at. We are still in the middle of the May 3rd lineup number two drop. And next week we will have the lineup number three drop followed by a week off. So the in-between, we're still going to have the, the weeks off in between two drops. It's just that now every drop will be unique players. So just wanted to quickly touch on that. I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to add to it. No, I, I think it's a good change, but, but it, it's difficult to say because I like that we're not going to see any two drops have the same players because that that's what we had assumed it was going to be. There was going to be, you know, lineup number two packs with 180 different players this week and then lineup number two packs with the same 180 players next week. Uh, on the one hand, if there were 180 players in these 30,000 packs that they released today, there'd be less copies of each card this week but then on the other hand we'd have those other 30,000 packs coming next week maybe not being so excited about them knowing that they're the exact same but in this case at least we know we're getting 90 new players next week and I'm excited to get the checklist for the lineup number three and see who's going to be involved in that one obviously it won't be Trout or Rotani but it might be someone else like a Juan Soto or a Vladimir Guerrero Jr. you know we can only speculate at this point but it gives us something new to look forward with each drop. Yeah. Yeah. You make a good point there. I mean, having the 180 players allowed us the luxury of having a few more, uh, a few more star players in there. Obviously we had double the, double the volume. I think that they leaned on Otani a little bit, a little bit heavily mm -hmm. in here uh, because he was going to be in this. They, they saved some other guys. We've speculated that Trout would have his own, Otani would have his own, and then you'd see Vlad, Acuna, Soto, and Tatis get split out two and two. But now that we've got seven lineups, I imagine those guys are each going to have their own as well. So mm -hmm. those likely won't ever double up, which would be smart. It'd be the right way to do it. But like you said, it means that we just don't have quite as much star power, which is kind of parlaying into the fact that we already have a lot of lackluster names in here. So we're seeing them make adjustments. We're seeing them make corrections and try to do the best with, with what the current situation is. But clearly they outkicked their coverage a little bit here and, mm -hmm. and they're scrambling to, to put band-aids on a problem that has a core issue that can't really be solved with band-aids. So it's, you know, is there a, is there not enough demand here for the supply? Yeah. I mean, that's part of it and and cutting the packs was was a response to that but there's also there's more to it than that i think that i think that an issue here is that there's just not a whole there's not a whole lot of we haven't been given a hierarchy of value here it has completely been left to the collector to decide how it is that that we're going to value these cards and because of that currently the low price point of the 22 stuff is winning out and it's dragging the 21 stuff down with it. And none of us want to see that. So there needs to be some attention pointed back, not just at the 21s, but at all of the cards and give a little bit of definition to why you should desire a certain year, a certain rarity, a certain player, and what mm -hmm. that is going to do within the ecosystem of this project. And so that can come in the form and these are generic terms that can be implemented in a whole lot of different ways and i'm not claiming that i have all the the perfect answers but the the terms that get thrown around are gamification or fantasy baseball and collector score and if you can start to implement some type of hierarchy 
where there is an actual tangible value being applied to owning an uncommon versus a core, to owning a rare versus an uncommon. Now you start to have an understanding of why maybe you shouldn't sell your rare 22s for $5 of a lesser mm -hmm. player. So I think collector score can help raise the floor of the whole project of even the bad cards, whereas gamification is going to help amplify the value of those top guys. So it works from both sides of it. But up to this point, we're just relying on everybody to come up with their own valuation. And why would you go spend thousands of dollars on a 21 Otani if you can go spend hundreds of dollars on a 22 Otani when you haven't been told why one's worth more than the other. Yeah, original stuff mm -hmm. is cooler. The mint counts are lower. You and I both feel that way. You and I both still have clarity on what we would prefer, but it's still just a it's just a preference. We're not right about it and we're not wrong about it. There there is no right or wrong answer. So there needs to be something more substantiated here in my opinion in order to point people in the direction of why things should be valued in in certain ways and Go from there. I agree with a lot of what you just said. Um, there's definitely a lot of work left for Candy to do to to give us reasons to apply value, because you know the thing about NFTs and, and collectors and collectibles in general, even physical collectibles, is they don't often have intrinsic value. You can't take a bobblehead and build a house out of it. You know it's valuable because of the extrinsic reasons that we apply to it and so they have to give us extrinsic reasons to apply value other than how much we love this player or how few of them there are um, the thing that i keep coming back to though is i'm not crazy about the way that they handled the early access for these packs both in terms of the tier structure for qualifying for early access and how many packs they allocated to early access and even how long a period of time early access is for. And, and so the tier structure, for example, they had three different tiers and depending on which reason you had for qualifying for early access determined which drops you would qualify for. If you had a complete all-star set that was one of the more difficult things to achieve. That was a tier one. That qualifies you for every lineup. If you pulled a legendary or you had a hoops chaser, that was tier two. And that qualified you for each lineup as long as you continued to hold that legendary or that hoops chaser. And I'm fine with both of those tiers because there's some level of exclusivity, some level of feeling like a reward for having collected a certain amount or put enough effort into building your collection up that it felt like we're being rewarded to have early access to the newest packs. But then we have tier three where at first it was any 10 play of the days and some play of the days were very inexpensive. So it did not cost much money at all to qualify for tier three. And then most recently they added any 30 core cards, which many core cards could be had for 50 cents, less than a dollar in many cases. And there's effectively no barrier of entry to early access, which makes me kind of annoyed when I built a full all-star set and the value of that access is exactly the same as someone who spent $15 on 30 cores. And so they, I feel like, expanded it too much, but then also provided too many cards to the early access group. I'm sure they felt like they had to allocate a lot of packs to the early access group because of how much they expanded, how many people qualified. But if they had a smaller group and an even smaller amount of packs, then we would have seen a situation where those few people who qualified for early access would have been able to fully sell out a much smaller group of packs, maybe 4,000 or 5,000 packs could have you know gone in a hurry. They could have reduced how many packs we could buy in early access. So it wasn't 
the same people buying 20 or 30, but everyone who qualified for that exclusive group getting five or 10 could have sold out and they could have had a longer period of time where only people with early access had the cards. Maybe instead of two hours, it's 10 hours or 24 hours. Just a period of time where if you had early access, you're the only people with the 2022 cards and that gives us a longer window of time to set values on things because if they drop 16,000 packs to early access and only nine of 9,000 of them sell, but we see 10, 15, 20 Otani epics pulled, there's going to be a lot of competition to sell those Otani, Otani epics from those who pulled them. But if you have a much smaller group of pack and you have a longer window of time where only early access has available has has them available, there might only be three Otani Epics pulled. And they're going to be, for that window of time, that 12, 24 hours, they're going to be a much bigger deal, which will inform the, the general access in a more tangible way of the type of value they might expect. Instead, people seem to come into lineup number two already considering the prices from lineup number one. And it's not necessarily going to be a one-to-one -one situation. And so people are already underpricing good cards because they've learned from the past three weeks that that's all they think they're worth. And so I feel like that mismanagement of early access size, early access pack allocation, and just the amount of time that early access was exclusive, I think has contributed in a negative way to how these drops have been playing out. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you and I, neither one of us was, we were both scratching our heads when we saw the early access announcement. Uh, it felt like, you know, and just to for reference, like you said, the lowest barrier to entry for the first lineup was depending on when you, if you got in super early, it'd cost you a hundred bucks, cost you mm. at least 150 bucks for most people's upwards of 200. So not super cheap, not super expensive, a respectable number. Somebody had to make a decision there. That's several packs worth of money to, to try and get that. But to your point, all of a sudden it was anybody that bought 10 plus packs last, last round pretty much already had early access and to me, it's not even about, it's not, now, I don't have the same perspective of you as you because I didn't do that volume of collecting. My early access is through being in the suite and, and I'm grateful for that. But to me, the problem here is that I saw early access as this moment of excitement where in the first lineup, early access sold out in 13 minutes mm -hmm. and that created this buzz that for general access, you need to get your packs because these things are, are selling, they're moving. And so for early access to not sell out is so, it just makes no sense to me. Early access should be this limited edition thing that if you get access to it, you're fortunate to get it because it's a, an opportunity to get a leg up and get something before it's gone. And, mm -hmm. and I was having a really good, really good conversation with Shadsman earlier about how the early Top Shot days, the lottery was whether or not you were gonna get a pack. You'd get into the queue, and, and I remember this, because I, I, I didn't get super into Top Shot, but I was in it early on. And the, the question was, am I gonna get one or not? And there were problems with that process too. It took hours and it was whatever, but if you got your pack, you won. And mm -hmm. now the lottery is in opening the pack as opposed to getting the pack. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not saying that I don't understand. I knew that going into it because I knew what the lineup was. I knew that this was going to look more like a regular pack of baseball cards. But that's not what I had been hoping for for the last few months. You know, I had been hoping for three to 450 players, something a little bit more focused where the upside was bigger. So I think actually a good segue here. Let me let me pull up. These are the top five floors or sorry, the top four floors, the top four players in lineup number two here. So Otani far and away the top, and then you've got Turner, Scherzer, and Bogarts coming in at two, three, and four. Turner and Scherzer almost identical with their epics. 
slight nod to Scherzer on his rares right now, but obviously that stuff is in flux. But to me, the problem here is that Shohei Otani is the best player in baseball. And if you pull his uncommon, you broke even. That just doesn't add up to me. So you've got, you're pulling a rare of Trey Turner, a rare of Scherzer, a rare of Bogarts. You're either not breaking even or just barely breaking even. You've got epics that don't break even. If you pull an epic, you should be pumped. If you pull mm -hmm. a rare of Xander Bogarts, you should be pumped. But if you pull a rare of Xander Bogarts, it's worth 50% of what you paid on that pack. And so, like I said, I don't have all the answers, but there are a lot of different ways to, to point value at these things. Collector score, the way that packs are distributed, gamification, all this different stuff. We're all just kind of left flailing in the wind right now. And yes, these are meant to be collectibles. And we talk about that all the time. And obviously we're, we're diving into this a little bit deeper than we usually do right now. But it's, it's a little bit scary to see where things are at right now and know that reaction is needed here because these numbers are just not really adding up. And we saw that in the fact that it's 8.52 on Tuesday night right now. And these packs have not sold out. They, have, they haven't even sold two thirds out yet. So people have realized that the value is buying in the marketplace, not the packs. And now again, I'm not trying to sound super negative. These packs are still fun. I still like this product. I still believe in candy long-term. There's still so much to be excited for here. But if the main goal here is that these are collectibles and we're collecting, but the my collection tab still looks like it you know we can't even in fully enjoy that right now without it being cluttered mm -hmm. and and muddled to get through so we got to have something here there's just too much product to have zero direction as to how to use it even if that's just a cooler way to look at our stuff and share it with friends we got to have something here it's just there's too much and we've got nothing to do with it and as critical as we're being I know that we're both still very confident in the candy team. Absolutely. We know that they're up to the task and long term, I feel assured that my investment in these collectibles is going to pay off. I, I, I'm like I said, I'm confident in that. It's just a question to me of how long it takes them to get this platform, to get this product to the place that we know they're capable of. And Right now, it's not there yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're on the same page. I love this project. I love the members of the community that I've met, the, the members of the, you know, the community managers, the, the different employees of Candy. I still believe in this project, and I love this project. And of course, I'm biased. I love baseball. I'm having fun with it. I'm a fantasy baseball guy. So yes, I, I want this just because I want it. But in order for this to, to succeed, especially in the short term, we're just talking about things that we're looking at and feeling like, you know, some adjustments need to be made here in order for this to be sustainable, especially because you don't want to lose your, your earliest collectors to, to feeling frustrated because then you have to rebuild. And that's, I certainly think that that is possible, but it's just not what you want to do. You've already got a really awesome base of, of community members here. You've got an awesome product. These cards are beautiful. They are so much nicer than any other sports NFT that I've seen. Like they really are putting out a quality, quality product where the, the play of the days are selling every day. There's so much excitement around that. The, the one of one auctions, you know, yes, there, there have been criticisms of the different drops in the volume of product. But the bottom line is if you're just looking at it, at these, the quality of these NFTs, it's a beautiful product that's being put out. It just needs a little bit more guidance. We just need a little more structure here to 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 put this all together. So that's uh that's my two cents on that. Yeah, I, that's yeah, that's where we both stand for the moment. Um, I'm gonna keep buying some packs. You know, I, I like ripping packs. I like the chance of getting a legendary. Or if there's still you know eight World Series NFTs that are gonna be released. In these next few months mm -hmm. you know that one in the last drop one in this drop 
and presumably one or two in each of the next upcoming drops, I want to have the chance to pull one of those, but I'm doing it with my eyes wide open, knowing that these $50 packs I'm opening, they're not likely to have $50 worth of content inside. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm fortunate enough that whatever I do pull, I can sit on it. I can pull five relievers like I almost did last week, and I can just sit on them until they've built up the reason to give value to them. You know, I don't have to sell them for a dollar. You know, no one can make me do that, but it means that at least until they have value, that, you know, that potential value is just tied up while I wait. Right. And so... And people have and limited funds, so... Sorry. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, not, not everyone has that luxury to be able to, to drop several hundred dollars into packs knowing that it might take months before they're worth the amount that you put in. Right. Yeah. It's, and I was about to make the same point. Everybody has limited funds. There's a limited amount that they can put into something. So if you can spend $200 on four packs or you can go grab, you know, a rare Otani, some people might just go grab that rare Otani. Some people are still going to rip packs and you and I are doing a little bit of both because we're enjoying it from mm -hmm. all angles. It's, you know, we are still enjoying opening packs because opening packs is fun. The upside is certainly still there. Um, but it's just, we need the scales to tilt a little bit back in the other direction. So speaking of packs, shall we open some packs? Um, well, I did want to just touch on the, the lineup number one okay. sales yeah, yeah. from the past week. Uh, we're not going to get into them super detailed. And of course, we're only looking at the 25 top players, the ones that include legendaries as well as the three or four other players that we're choosing to look at alongside them. Uh, last week, we noted that Miguel Cabrera far and away outsold everyone else, and, and we could see the real-life factors that contributed to that. Uh, and so he did not have that type of performance this week. You know, he fell much more in the middle of the pack. Um, but the players who did sell the most from lineup number one this past week uh, we had uh, Giancarlo Stanton. Uh, he sold 57 cards across all rarities, uh, including being the number one seller of epics. He sold nine epics this past week. Um, also near the top of the list was Anthony Rendon, selling 56, and Christian Yelich, also selling 56. And so there were a handful of guys who did about 50 to 55 sales. Um, and... For the most part, the prices on lineup number one are slightly up from where they were last week. You know, at least on the players that we're tracking, because we're not tracking the entire 180. Uh, at least not at this point. It's going to take a little bit more infrastructure for me to be able to pay attention to that many players at once. Um, but for the most part, prices were slightly up for the, you know, for the players that are in the top of these lists, and you know, it's. So at least it's not bad news for that lineup number one. Uh, we had, you know, some relatively, you know, significant gains as well. Um, we have like Jonathan India sold three epics and saw his epic for increase from $85 to $110. You know, things like that. Some small wins across the board for some of these top 25 players. That's a thin 110 too. After that one, it goes to 185 and then 199. Okay, on, on and and, India. and right, and these snapshots of information we're taking, they're kind of subject to the whims of where listings happened to be at that time. You know, it might appear that someone's price fell, and that might only be because someone put a low listing that happened to be there during that window of time where I was gathering my information. Yeah, and so that that does color things. But at the, the very least, over a period of multiple weeks, we can see clear patterns emerge. I also wanted to just quickly talk, you and I have, we've now had a little bit more time to develop our, our process here. And so while we have our criticisms about PACs and all of that, we are still very, very heavily engaged in this project. And that engagement has been in the marketplace because that is where the opportunity is right now. Now, but we've we've kind of veered 
you and I, in two different directions. But I like both of them, and I think that I need to take a little bit of your medicine. You need to take a little bit of mine. We'll combine. But you've continued to go very metric-driven in terms of price points and accumulation, which in terms of if we get a collector score type deal, I think that your method benefits that greatly because you're accumulating volume at, at mm. very good prices. I, on the other hand, have admittedly, I've shifted away, not permanently, but in the short term, I've shifted away from trying to collect the full set. I know that you're still try working towards the full 22 set, and I certainly may do it at some point, but I've shifted my focus pretty heavily towards the gamification upside, which is that I'm really focusing in on, you know, a handful of players, certainly those, the top 25 or the, the top guys that are getting the one of ones, you know, they're doing these in order of player quality, give or take. So mm -hmm. I've, I have shifted my focus towards uncommon plus of, of the higher tier players and some guys that I just, that stand out to me for whatever reason. And you got to come up with your own list, use your own baseball knowledge, but you know, the, yeah, I don't know. Do you want to? It's. Do you want to speak on on your approach at this point? Has it changed at all from from lineup one to lineup two? You know what? What is it? What is your in these first twelve hours? Not even. What has your approach been? I mean, it's very similar to how it was with lineup number one. Uh, it's a bit more focused this time. I had more time with the checklist to to do my research ahead of time, so I I took the full checklist. I split it into pitchers and non-pitchers just because pitchers in general don't have as much value as position players and using that as my guide filtering it by which ones had legendaries which ones had epics which ones only had rares and uncommons I was able to just kind of aggressively target at least one purchase from each player and, and I'm not done yet but I'm, I'm nearly done I've got about 80 out of the 90 players now and for the most part I've paid between 50 cents and a dollar for my cores and between one and two dollars for my uncommons and so i'm i won't have any firm numbers for a couple days still until i'm i'm done but i'll probably end up paying maybe 150 dollars, probably less for these 90 players and to put a complete set together for the entire leadoff series 720 players that type of ratio is one that I'm comfortable with. There are some players that I'm going to go in a bit more on. All of my San Francisco Giants, I'm going to try and get one of each of their rarities. So I have a core, uncommon, and a rare for Brandon Belt now. I still need an epic, but I'm going to be shopping around. I'm going to be waiting for a better deal before I pull the trigger on that. But yeah, I do want to cast my net as wide as possible with these new drops, particularly in those first few hours of general access where there seem to be the most deals available. Uh, you know, one that slipped by me, there was a, it was like a, a Jersey number uncommon for one of the players that went for like one or $2. It was just a case of someone not knowing what they had and listing it at a $2 floor because they didn't know what they had. And so if you have the ability to pay attention right when general access starts, you can find good deals that uh, at price points that are going to hold up even as you know things settle down. Yeah, I th you make a really good point in terms of re like pre uh, preemptive research. We get these lineups in advance. Sometimes it's a week, sometimes it's a couple of days, but whatever it is, it doesn't take. Especially now that it's only ninety players, it doesn't take that long to look through it and come up with a hypothesis. And it does not have to be a significant hypothesis. It can be one or two guys that you're looking at, or it can be number driven like yours. But taking a look at it and just deciding how you want to approach it on a personal level, this is why we say do your own research. It's not just a, a line, it's not just a thing to plug at the beginning of this to cover ourselves. It is really how you should do this. You should come up with your own theories and execute on them within your means and then learn from it. Try something, see how it goes, adjust, try something new. You and I have been doing this for a year plus now across a whole bunch of different NFT projects, and now we're doing it here in a space that's about baseball that we both love so much. So coming up with these things not only is the best way to, to learn and educate and, and improve your process, but it's also the most fun. 
if you come up with something and you get it right and you buy those cards and all of a sudden you see that your your two dollar uncommons are up at a floor of five or six bucks it's only a couple bucks but it's fun to be right it's fun to win it's fun to to be proven that that you are focusing on the right things and so it's not all about the money but it is a metric to look at that helps guide if you're making the right decisions it's not to say that if you overpay on something that it's a bad move we still believe in the long-term nature of this and that that helps everything and that's why the stuff that you buy should be stuff that you're excited to hold but you gotta come up with theories or don't if you don't care to but if you're in here to to have fun with this and and turn it into your own little game which clearly that's what you and i like to do then you got to look at it from a certain angle like that and so for me i'm i'm taking basically i'm taking your approach on anybody with an anybody in that epic tier so for this it's the top 32 guys last lineup it was the top 65 guys but Anybody in that top and then a couple trickle down into the rare, basically the guys that are most relevant to fantasy, if I see a $2 on common, I'm grabbing them. I don't care how much I like them or not, I'm grabbing it. So I'm using your metric on that one. I am I am leaving the baseline at uncommon just because I'm still hypothesizing that you'll get a multiplier for that. So I could be completely wrong on that. So please do not follow that unless you believe it as well, is I am just going on a whim and hoping that I'm right. But that's my hypothesis. So I'm focusing on cheap two, $3 uncommons of those most fantasy relevant guys. And I'll raise that price point a bit for the right names. You gotta, you gotta come up with it, do your research, look at some other guys that are similar category. And then from there, the guys that I really like, that's where I'm starting to look at Rare Plus. Again, mm-hmm. on the premise that Maybe there's a better multiplier for rare and a better multiplier for epic. And so while I might not be jumping to buy an Otani epic right now, if there's a guy that's on the cheaper side with epics, if, you know, a lot of these epics are 35, 45, 55, I bought a Pablo Lopez epic for $45 the other night. He then promptly gave up his first home run of the season 15 minutes later as I was watching him. So that was fun. But uh, he's a guy that has a sub one ERA. He is poised to be big in fantasy if he continues to put up those numbers, and his epic was 45 bucks. If I get a 2x multiplier on that for running him out as a starter in whatever the gamification might be, you know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm gambling on that. I could be wrong. We could not get fantasy baseball until next year. They could not put multipliers at all. So it's, it's about trying to come up with a concept and executing on it within your means. That's kind of how I'm doing this. And it, it, it gives me a little bit more purpose as a collector. I'm not a big set guy. I didn't do the 21 sets. I started doing the 22 set. I might do it eventually, but it's never been my MO, not in video games, not in this, not in, in regular cardboard collecting. It's more about collecting what I, what I like and see, but it's to each their own. So I, it's been fun talking with you and, and seeing us both adapt and, um, develop our own our own process of of how we like to collect so that has been that has been a lot of fun and there's been some good opportunities for both of us to to kind of seize on what we were focusing on this past week you know just yesterday it seems like longer ago i you know well last week i should say we spent about 10 minutes talking about juan soto rares and how many he sold and how restricted his supply was and i saw an opportunity where there was a new listing on a new Juan Soto rare and it was very reasonable and i I just had that opportunity to put my money where my mouth was and i pulled the trigger i I owned the Juan Soto rare that sold yesterday because i believe in my method and the data that i'm keeping track of now there's been 44 Juan Soto rares sold and one just got pulled out of circulation for probably a very long time. I'm not looking to move this anytime soon, but I have a belief in the type of information that I'm keeping track of and in how I feel that's going to be affecting the valuation on these cards. You know, there's only four current listings for Juan Soda Rares, and only a couple of them are even reasonable. The rest are the other two are really expensive. We're probably not going to see any sales at that price point. But my thinking is 
that's all there is. And once those have sold, then there'll be even less listings and even less in circulation and so forth. And and you have also had opportunity within the players that you're focusing on, within your, you know, your fantasy metric driven, you know, targeting of specific players to pick up some good deals mm-hmm. on some of those rares and epics. And that's all we can do. We can, you know, come up with a good strategy and when the opportunity arrives, we can follow through with it because we actually believe in in, you know, how we think that's gonna play out. Definitely. Yeah. I was super pumped for you to, to grab that. That was a really exciting buy and I do feel like it's all been leading up to this moment. We've we've had so many segments about that rare Soto and uh, <laughs> it was cool to have it come to fruition and, and have you put that in your collection. So Congrats on that. My my mini win that I think you're referring to here was my my rare wander that I picked up today. I had been watching been watching that one. Love him for fantasy. Love him as a long term hold. Uh, I also just I, I like the value on rares right now. Been watching that. He had one at 175 get bought a few days ago. Floor settled back at 200, and then somebody posted one uh, for a nice little discount at 165 today and. Decided mm-hmm. to quickly pull the trigger after regretting letting that 175 go away. So happy to have one of those. And on that note, one of the reasons why I like, amongst many reasons why I like Wander, is that it's his first card. Just like mm-hmm. it's Miguel Cabrera's first card. There's just a little bit of added security in that, in my opinion, compared to getting a card that already has a 21 card. It's not to say that I'm not buying those as well. Can't wait to get my hands on an Epic Bogarts and stuff like that. But there's just a little bit of added value there, in my opinion, when it's the guy's very first card. So guys like Miggy and and Wander and Harper, they come with that that added element. Um, and it's just another little wrinkle that I'm looking at. And we know that badges are coming eventually. We know that down the road, there's going to be a little icon that says Candy NFT Debut or something to that effect. And so because because we know that's coming we can assign value to it and make a play regarding that before it even happens you know it's i'm trying to think of a good example but it's like when there's a popular store that's being built in somewhere you just know that the land surrounding it is going to become more valuable Mm. it might not be worth much now but because you see an improvement coming you can get ahead of it you can make the play now knowing that the value is coming later. And that is basically the the bottom line of what I was saying before about coming up with a hypothesis. There's no reward if you don't take risk. So you can just take what's given and that's fine. If you wanna just buy packs and open them and own cards, that is totally cool. There is no problem with that whatsoever. Enjoy yourself. Know, know what makes this fun for you and do that. But if you're trying to get some upside you got to try and think of something before the masses think of it or more importantly just you got to think of it before candy tells you that it's a thing <laughs> it once it's announced the gig is up right mm-hmm. there were there were a ton of sub $1 cores available prior to the pack drops getting cut in half it was mm-hmm. it was hugely available and i was being patient cuz i thought we were getting another 60,000 packs right. coming the fu- so i was I knew that the supply was going to get further flooded. So I was working on a hypothesis, but I got it wrong because they flipped the script and that's cool. It was better for the project. And that's the name of the game. These things are going to going to get flipped on us, but it's just the way it goes. You come up with a hypothesis, you execute on it and you see what happens. So let's rip some packs. Let's rip some packs. Now um, it is your week to go first, but I think I should start with my, 21 packs okay because one thing that candy did this week is they gave out a few extra free packs from lineup number one to people who had the the gold chaser for completing the all-star set or had the julio chaser for completing the uncut diamond set and since i held both I completed both sets i got five five free packs love it and that's more than i typically would open while we record each week but these are free packs. Whatever is inside, that's a win. And so I, I took down the numbers of specifically the packs that I was given for free, and those are the five I'm going to open. Just see what's inside. Let's do it. So uh, 
Am I all set on your side? You are good to go, my friend. Okay, then the first one is pack 13, 591. Although maybe you're maybe you're a little bit frozen. Have you gone into a pack already? Not yet. I'm on the unwrap a pack screen. Okay, then I'm not with you yet. So give me a second. Okay. Well, in fact, one thing they mentioned. Oh, there we go. I just caught up to you. I'm with you now. Anyways, because they did mention that it might make like those problems where it the pack got frozen. It might make it better if you just do a refresh ahead of time. Okay. So I'm with. I'm that. fully with you now. Okay. And now I'm getting ready to unwrap. Uh, no thumbtacks. They kind of let me down last week. <laughs> so instead, I have some pennies. Oh, I'm definitely I, putting my hat back on. Well, I mean, that definitely works. You that epic bucks. That's you, you hold on to that hat. Yep. <laughs> I've got some pennies that I flipped earlier today. These were the ones that landed on heads. So these are my lucky pennies. See how it works out with okay. the first pack. Okay. First one is at least opening. And two uncommons. So nothing special yet. And I'm just going to get through these kind of quickly because I do have more packs than usual to rip. Uh, first core is an Alec Bohm from the Phillies. Second core is a Chris Bubich from the Royals. Core number three, Alex hey. Vizia, the Dodgers, got the stash. Meme stash. Meme stash. I mean, I wouldn't have been excited three weeks ago, but <laughs> that, that's a pull now. Uh, first uncommon. That's why I like meme cards. Is going to be Anthony Rendon, third base for the Angels. And second uncommon george springer all right back to back the... uh decent fantasy pulls there both uncommon yeah. both uncommons were, mm -hmm. were solid so you know no rares no epics but as uncommons go that was a that was a good pack next pack is number 16 124 another free pack from candy opening oh new penny And a rare. All right, a little rare ski. Okay. A little rare ski. First core, Manuel Margot for the race. Second core, Tarek Skubal for the Tigers. Apologize if I'm butchering any of these names. Third core, Nick Gordon for the Twins. Shortstop. The uncommon is Yasmani Grandal for the Sox. White Sox, I should say. And the rare crowning jewel of this pack is going to be Ian Happ for the Cubs. So it had a rare, but the quality of the players was not quite as good in this pack. But I will take the rare just the same. Next pack. 18581. Okay, so that penny was kind of a bust. Set that one to the side. New penny. Pack number three. I still love watching these things get opened. I know it's. Hey, there we go. There we go. Perfect. perfect. This is that. That was a shiny penny. That's. I think I've already said this before, but the thing that I like better about opening NFT card packs versus physical ones is that it's you get two layers to it. You've got the excitement of, did I get an Epic? And then you get the second layer of what are the players? And you just don't right. get that with a regular pack of baseball cards. And I, I mean, I'll find out in a second, but I, I could be staring at an Epic Trout or an Epic Franco right now. Let's we'll, hope. We'll find out. Let's hope. Uh, first core was Alec Mills, starting pitcher for the Cubs. Second core is Ross Stripling, relief pitcher for the Blue Jays. Third core, Will Myers, right fielder for the Padres. The uncommon, Shane McClanahan, nice. starting pitch for the Rays. That's a good pull. And the epic. Here we go. Anthony Rendon, third base for the Angels. All Another right. Rendon. That is, that is a good pull. This, yeah. this pack more than paid for itself. Yeah, it's a solid pack. I mean, of course it did. It's free. 
<laughs> Even if I paid fifty for that pack, that was that was a quality pack. So that's pack number three. This penny is gonna get a special seal for sure. I bet by the end of the year, McClanahan is your favorite pull from that pack. Really? Yeah, he's I'm really have good. To keep him on my radar then. I get the benefit okay. of watching a lot of Rays games as a Red Sox fan, and they've got some seriously good pitching. So pack number four. And again, these are all lineup number one packs that were distributed to the chaser holders, so it won't be any lineup number two players quite yet. First core, Kyle Lewis for the Mariners. Second core, Ryan Mountcastle for the Orioles. I believe I pulled one or two of them last week. Then third core, Luis Gill for the Yankees, starting pitcher. Now the uncommons. First is Yodsi Sutsugo for the Pirates. And second uncommon, Randy Ar Randy for the race. <laughs> a Rosa Reina. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we should yes, in, we should just intentionally say all the names wrong and then we can't be wrong. Okay. Well but see then I'll put myself on blast by saying it right on accident. <laughs> so that was a decent pack. I'm I'm definitely happy with the Randy on that one. And now the fifth free pack, penny number five, and another two uncommon. So I had one rare and one epic from these five packs, which definitely above average on the epic, um, but I would have liked another rare perhaps. Uh, first core, DJ LeMahieu for the Yankees. Second core, Garrett Crochet, Crochet for the White Sox. Third core, Craig Stammen for the Padres. And then the Uncommons. We have another Yoshi Satsugo for the Pirates. It's two of those. And Nick Pavetta, starting pitcher for the Red Sox. Nicky P. Okay. That, I mean, the the epic, that was a uh, Rendon, wasn't it? That, yep. That was a good pull. But no. uh, I'm, I'm happy with that. I know you were going to send it back to me, but we've got your stream running pretty smooth here. So if you're cool so maybe, with it, let's just run it and let's jump into your lineup twos. Okay. And then we'll jump over to mine after. All right. Then we're going to start with this winning penny from that epic. We'll go back to that one. And I'm just going to pick the two at the top here. So my first pack from lineup number two. This is my first rip from lineup number two. I know. Neither one of us have ripped one yet. Let's go. Open for an Otani. Let's see it. Oh no. Oh no. Is it because I didn't refresh? Uh, you have the worst luck with this, man. Well, the good news is, is well, no, that, I was going to say you're going to be able to figure it out, but you're not because you've already bought <laughs> 80 of the cards. Oh. oh, and I already got rid of my checklist. Otherwise, I could have just pulled up my checklist in two separate tabs and looked for the differences. But now it's too late. The third black screen of death. Okay. Uh, let's go back into the collection. Oh, I don't need to be on page 12, though. Okay. Page one. Going to do a quick refresh. Going to pick the next pack. This penny is no longer lucky. Grab a new penny and unwrap. Okay, this pack works. Two uncommons. Um, see what we got. Hoping for an Otani. First core, CJ Crone for the nice. Rockies. Good player there. Second core, Chris Stadden for the Pirates. Stratton. Excuse me. Third core, Kyle Farmer, shortstop for the Reds. And the Uncommons. First Uncommon, John Brebbia for the Giants. Happy about that. Grabbing a Giant. And second Uncommon, JP Fire. I think it's Fire Eisen, and I don't think he's given up a run yet this year. He's one okay. Of the, one of the well, better relievers in this, uh, in this set. Then let's hope he keeps it up. Second Uncommon, JP Fire Ryzen for the Rays. So I'll need to spend a few minutes to figure out what was in that other pack. 
kind of disappointed about that. Yeah, that's but... that's rough. But it did seem like every single thing that you refreshed worked. That was the only one that you forgot to refresh on. So it looks like maybe that trick is effective to some extent. Maybe, but I still went back into the collection anew after mm. the last Planet Number 1 pack. True. And I thought that would have done the trick. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's... That's me done. I'm really happy with those packs that Candy provided me from lineup number one. And I will reserve judgment on lineup number two until I've ripped a few more. Yeah. I'll have to find those. Go find the uh, the legendary somewhere in your collection. I know. If I stumble across it now, that will be the anti-hype. All right. I'm going right from the top. Wait. What? Are, I'm supposed to refresh. You're also supposed to be wearing something else. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Almost forgot my pack hat. Thank you. Disaster averted. I've also been notified by multiple people that I do not do as good a job as David at calling out my pack contents for the uh, the audio only listeners. So I'm gonna try and do a better job at that. Pack number one. Let's go. Epic right off the Epic. bat. Let's Beautiful. go. Okay. Let's see it. Look at it. Just Any let's just look. Just look at it. Spin for a second. Just look at it. It's beautiful. All right. First core. Sam Howard, reliever from the Pittsburgh Buckos. Core number two, Sky Bolt, best name in baseball, center field for the A's. Perfect name for a player. Right? It's crazy. Miguel Rojas, core shortstop for the Marlins. Uncommon. Jace Peterson. All right, pretty lackluster on the players, which means that this epic has all the juice. All right, here we go. Nice, we'll take that. Ian Anderson, epic. Stud pitcher for the Braves. Decent pull, decent pull. All right, that's a good start. Yeah, can't be mad with an epic right off the bat. Let's take a look at that real quick. A little epic Ian Anderson. His epics are trading in the low 40s right now, but there's not too many listings, so it's going to be interesting to see where those settle. I will be holding this bad boy for fantasy purposes. Yeah, I mean, and for all we know, you got the number one, so we're going to have to yeah, find that's, out. That's true. This is true. Find out what you got. All right. Right off the top, pack number dose. Here we go. All right, two uncommons. Two uncommons. Can't be greedy. Can't be greedy. First core, Nathaniel Lowe, first base for the Texas Rangers. Jonathan, do you know how to say this one? Shoop. Scope. Scoop. Scope. Scope. First wow. base for the Tigers. All right, one of my socks, Kevin Plowecki. All right, the two uncommons. Julian Merriweather, reliever for Toronto. Mm. And Trey Mancini. All right, we'll take a little Trey Mancini. This guy's a good story, good hitter. Uncommon and, I mean, Mancini. That hat is still batting 500 yeah. on Epic. Hey, man, two that's... Four. Yeah, so, two, we, this, this hat's going nowhere. It's going nowhere, but... You would need to have a couple bad weeks in a row before we have to question that hat. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we're at an hour and 10 minutes, so to anybody that's still here, thank you for being here. Uh, today is an exciting day, and we've got some things looking to improve, but we still got a lot to be excited for, still having a lot of fun with this project, and appreciate everybody that that comes and watches and, and hangs out with us on Wednesday nights. So my name is Nate. That's David. This is the Talking Candy weekly update. Appreciate you being here and we will see you in the next one.